Hi, Personal Health and Wellness. It's time to talk what you are made of. We are in the body composition module, and we are going to have a deep conversation about your body tissues. Now, first of all, what we have to understand is that this term body composition, um, at least the way I'm going to present it in this video, has a two-part definition. And those two parts are what part of you is fat or what part of you is fat free and there are tissues in your body and you're going to understand this by the end of this video that do not have essentially a large amount of fat to them and then you have to also remember that there's tissues in the body that are exclusively fat and so we kind of have to part these things out to understand what our body composition is and so why is this important well um, it is a major predictor of our health and our long-term quality of life. Uh, insurance companies and medical doctors will absolutely use this as a metric to help us understand where we are uh, with our health. Now, that being said, I have to kind of pause and say this, uh, and I have some links for you down here on this slide but you're now getting to understand how a single very unique determinant is used uh, by people who don't always have expertise on how to use it uh, a great example is how an insurance company will come in and use body mass index to determine your uh, life insurance premiums for instance um, another great example are these other two, um, which I found terribly interesting at, at reads, uh, so I had to include them. But if you look at the first one, how physicians only get, um, you know, about one class, and that's an elective that has to do with anything fitness. And if you look at the study deep enough, what you find is that 80% of curriculums in medical schools that actually report about what they're doing in medical school um, give no physical fitness um, as a part of their curriculum and so uh, you go down to the next one and you find out that doctors in medical school only get about 20 hours of training in nutrition but yet you go to a doctor and they say hey look your body composition's way out of whack you need to get it in check okay doctor how do i do that we need a diet and exercise. Okay, doctor, how do I do that? And they can't tell you, at least not with any validity, because they don't have training to do so. Unless they've done some, you know, external training or, or they have some merit and validity through some other patients, uh, I would say that um, you're going to have to look somewhere else. Um, and by all means, do not think that I'm, I'm trying to take away from the uh, – sheer professionalism and advantages of having medical doctors because they are very good at doing what they do. But what I'm trying to say is we many times are under the guise that that is the direction we should only go. But there are other professionals out there who probably would be better to seek out, especially on physical fitness and especially on nutrition, how to manage our own body composition. Now that that soapbox is over, Let's go and let's look at some very specific applications that are used uh, with the determinant of body composition. This all comes from the website ideafit.com uh, and body composition, its relationship to disease assessment. Uh, so first of all, it helps to identify a client's health risk associated with total body fat or excessive accumulation of intra-abdominal fat. And we're going to look at that here in just a moment. It helps to promote an understanding of health risks. Uh, and that happens because when you take a class like this, what you see is this word uh, overweight, overfat, and obesity pop up many times in risk factors. And what we've done is we've associated those with many of the the disease states and uh, problems that we have kind of come across. 
Number three, it monitors changes associated with specific diseases that alter body composition. A great example of that is cancer. And what we can do is monitoring body composition through cancer treatments. But also, we can look at that uh, from type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity and noticing that there are some variations there. And I would tell you that if you dig deep into the term insulin resistance, what you're going to find is most of those people are uh, pretty much would look more normal in their body composition. They're going to be a little leaner, but they're going to have higher insulin resistance. And why is that? So dig in deep and find out why and see if that's maybe uh, uh, an issue that you could be uh, struggling with on your own. Um, taking a look at the next one, it assesses the effectiveness of nutrition programs and exercise interventions. So we're actually taking this and using this as our metric and saying, okay, is this said exercise or said nutrition program effective? Um, and that's the number one thing to watch for uh, because it's something that we can use very quickly. And I'll show you how here in just a moment. Estimating your ideal body weight. Um, which is incredibly difficult, even when you think you've got it under control, um, you know, sometimes seeing some numbers pop up kind of changes the way we feel about things because numbers obviously don't lie, but sometimes they have limitations. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute. It investigates the relationship between body composition and increased morbidity and mortality, which is a critically important aspect when you consider things like cardiovascular disease being the number one killer and how obesity relates to that. Uh, I would also talk to you about how you monitor your growth and development, maturation, and age-related changes. Um, and I want to kind of stop and say this. We look at how a person ages over their lifespan, and what we know is that into their 20s, their brain and their vital organs stop growing. And so what we have to understand is that if the brain and the vital organs start growing, growing, then so should their body. Um, and many times that's not the case because in the ages of 20 is when we start to see a dramatic increase in our body composition or at least in our body fat. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, I would also tell you that the unique thing about formulating interventions and how we can use strategies that we're going to give you here in just a few moments uh, to prevent chronic diseases earlier or later in life, but that comes from preventing the obesity and the overweight from ever occurring. Um, and then finally, we can optimize athletic performance. When we talk nutrition, um, we're going to talk to you about the makeup of nutrition. Then we talk diet. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how diet comes down to two things. It comes down to uh, improving body composition or improving performance. That's the only two reasons a person really ever wants to diet. Um, now, there are some subset factors that go into that. When you improve your body composition, you decrease your risk of chronic disease and early mortality. And so, yes, definitely that's a, a bigger goal, but you have to look at the smaller steps into which you achieve that with. All of those coming from, again, this website here, there's your authors. And now let's talk about the different types of these fats that are out there. Remember we said that body composition is fat and then fat-free mass. So let's take a look at just fat specifically. And the starting point for that is at storage fat. This is the one that we think of the most when we hear the word fat. And remember, I'm talking about fat on your body. I'm not talking about fat that you consume off of your food. So let's just keep that straight right now. So we have two types. Number one is storage. Number two is essential. Well, let's look at storage. Storage is the one that we consider the most when we think about fat. And that is our adipose tissue storage like when there's some squish there 
that is typically subcutaneous fat and what you can feel. But there's a more dangerous type of fat known as visceral fat. And that is a fat that kind of likes to hoard up around our organs. And if you'll remember back when we talked chronic disease, we talked about something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that is where fat gathers around the liver. And this is that visceral fat. And it's found most commonly in the abdomen. And you're going to see a picture of that here in just a minute. Our number two type of body fat is essential, meaning it has to be there. This is what carries out a lot of important procedures in our body from brain to neurons, our nerves, also to our reproductive health, our heart health, and yeah, even that liver, it needs a certain level of fat. That's how it does its job. It's just when this stuff gets out of control that it becomes a problem. So we have this essential fat needed for our normal body functions and I highly recommend that you take a quick read at this University of New Mexico article about the differences between the two to help you understand what that essential fat is and, and give you a better picture into understanding how your body uses it. So we have to now look at this picture of Android versus gynoid shaping that typically occurs, um, uh, you know, and we talked about it just a minute ago, as you get into your 20s, how things start to change and that body continues to grow, even though our brain and our organs are staying the same size, our body still grows. And this is the typical um, delivery of that storage fat. Um, so we look at this and we see, first of all, the android or the apple shape here. And this is how we know visceral fat is occurring. And what we also know is this is the very dangerous type of fat. Anytime you see a larger amount there in the abdomen, you see that apple uh, type uh, delineation, then you know that visceral fat is forming and that's forming around the vital organs and especially the liver. And so I have to say this because I mentioned the liver so many times, um, I feel like sometimes I'm not being very clear, but the liver in and of itself is the only organ we really don't have like a bypass for. I mean, doctors can take you and, and perform a surgery where they, they put you underneath uh, anesthesia and they can bypass your, your heart. They can do things for all other organs. The liver and the pancreas, they don't really have a good, good way of doing that for, um, at least not to my knowledge of this video, uh, but the liver specifically, it has so many different functions. And so that's why I kind of keep pushing this back and saying, hey, pay attention to your liver. Don't just let it hang out there and gather up all the storage fat. The next one here is the pear. And this one at least for storage fat is a little bit better because it's not visceral, meaning around the abdominal organs. It kind of just collects around the hips. And so if you're looking at fat and saying, well, you know, at least I have this type of fat. Well, this is the one you would say, at least this is my my fat distribution as opposed to the apple. So the gynoid, clearly a much healthier, but still has some other issues um, that we really don't go into in this class, but they would stem more musculoskeletal or orthopedically because of just having heavier weight on joints and bones. So there again, that's your types of fat distribution. Um, on top of that, we have to look at some things called body frames or morphologies. And what we see here over on the left is kind of an ectomorph. This is your tall, skinny kind of, um, noodly kind of people, you know, they have longer arms that hang down uh, past the waist. Um, they have a fairly thin torso and they're tall. Uh, from that, you kind of move over to the opposite, which is an endomorph, which is typically a shorter, uh, rounder version of that person. Um, and these people tend to definitely gain weight where these people, you know, dramatically don't. Um, and that's a very unique thing about their framework. And then you kind of come over to more of an athletic look, which is known as mesomorph. Um, and any one of these actually can be mesomorphic. Um, it's just typically seen as kind of a, a more 
you know, athletic version um, and held out on its own. But you can see some resources will say um, you have ectomorph and endomorph, and out of that, they either move more to mesomorph or not. And so that's kind of another thing to think about as well. Um, so we have some metrics that we use uh, to measure our body composition. And I want to kind of just hit these really quickly because these are things that you've probably either participated in or you know about. Uh, and they can help you in your pursuit for a better body composition. So number one is our body weight. Body weight is simply how much do you weigh? Um, and most of us have been on a scale at some point. Uh, some of us have quite the version to scales. Um, I myself have found that I have preached in the classroom that you should avoid the scales and not hit them more than once every two to three weeks because you're going to see such variation. Um, I have since changed my opinion and that has a lot to do with the fact that I found myself kind of addicted to monitoring the scale. But what I found out was that I kind of had this this very unique weight that I was kind of pendling, uh, penduluming away from uh, either going heavy or going light. Um, and I knew that this one weight was kind of where I felt really, really good. Um, and I noticed that uh, my weight would shift. In fact, a really funny story is I happened to kind of have a rough weekend um, here just a few months ago where I kind of, well, just really bad. Um, I, um, and when I say really bad for me, um, it was it was pretty bad and, and I ate what I wanted. Um, and by fact, it was a lot of carbohydrates. Um, and I kind of surmised the weekend uh, by hitting a really good, by the way, but really large um, Sunday from Brahms. Um, and just so Brahms is good with me, it was amazing. Um, but I ate the whole thing by myself. And this was after a whole weekend of just kind of, you know, uh, it was a debacle, to be honest with you. But anyways, I woke up Monday morning. Um, I didn't weigh, but then on Tuesday morning, I did weigh. And I was quite alarmed because in the matter of 24 hours, I was up eight pounds, um, which is a major shift. Now, to be honest, I, I, I freaked out. But what I had to do was I had to kind of come back and say, okay, clearly this is like water. I didn't gain eight pounds of fat because I ate horrible for, you know, 24 hours of time. So one thing that you have to do is you have to keep that in mind. And we'll get into that in diet in just a, a few more modules. But typically when you get on a scale, you're looking at pounds or kilograms. And the unique thing is if you get on a scale often, what the data has found, and here's some research articles down here that you can view for yourself. The data is finding that those people who get on a scale very often um, actually lose and maintain their weight loss better because what they're understanding is they're seeing things day to day that make small influences. They understand what part of the day is better to weigh. They understand what kind of foods affect your current weight. They understand that what types of exercise affect your current weight. Um, my wife just happens to really enjoy weighing immediately after her long run for the week. And so she's like betting on the fact that when she weighs, she is going to weigh the very least she will weigh throughout the whole week. And that just makes her happy. Um, I'm happy because she's found a very consistent way of doing it. But I would tell you that if you look at the research, what you're going to find is the more frequently you do get on a scale, the more frequently you're going to appreciate the factors that are involved with your own body weight. So jump on it. Let me know how it goes. Number two is body mass index. Now, body mass index is a square of your body. So it's a mathematical equation. And that's exactly how it was created by a mathematician in the 1800s. So it's a very old way of basically saying, let's look at what the body is. Um, it is a square number that comes from your body weight versus your body height. Uh, and then you take that number and typically it's metric. So you're converting it to kilograms and centimeters and you're lumping it together and you're getting a number. Well, that number is supposed to depict how healthy you are, but it has limitations because it doesn't 
really take into account how much lean muscle you have, which weighs more than fat. It also doesn't account for bone structure, which can vary from person to person. It's just looking at you as a square, attaching a number, and this is unfortunately what a lot of our insurance companies, as well as our medical doctors do, and this helps to basically dictate how much you're paying in on premiums for your life insurance and health insurance and different tests and different things. This is what they use. And here's the scale down here below. And you can see it's a fairly small number depending upon what your height is versus what your weight is. Uh, there's a pretty small scale and either you're under it, or you're over it, or you're right in the sweet spot. And so when you're taking that number here and just a little bit on your own, and I want you to basically use this as your assignment, you're going to talk about how did that make you feel? What did you learn from it? Where did you actually sit? What can you do to make it better? Uh, here's some really interesting reads for you here uh, about the limitations that come about from body mass index. Number three is body circumferences. Um, and most of us have probably done this. In fact, no, let me stop. Every one of us do this every time we put on pants because we're doing a small little circumference check every time we put on our favorite pair of you know, whatever brand of jeans you like. And so I do this. I have a certain pair of jeans. I know how they fit. And if they're kind of needing a little bit of a tug, then I'm doing a body circumference check and I'm like, whoa, shouldn't have probably ate that extra steak last night. Kidding. That didn't do it. But you see where I'm going. What I know is that uh, I'm, I'm recreating this commonly. I don't always have to have my uh, tape to do this, but I did link a video um, into this module that shows you kind of how to do it. I also linked this right here, which is a CrossFit uh, um, uh, doctor who threw this in there, and it just gives you some more input on how to do it if that's something that you're wanting to do. Um, but typically, what we're doing is we're looking at the waistline right at the belly button, and it's it's just simple to do. It's nothing technical. I mean, all you got to do is be able to add, add, match the end of the tape measure to where it ends um, around your belly. And you can kind of watch this very quickly. I would tell you it's not going to change rapidly. So don't get like too, you know, crazy about it. Uh, but definitely think about what you are doing daily. And that is putting on those pants and seeing how they fit because that's your circumference measurement right there. Can be easily, uh, again, spelling mistake, my bad, watch this, bias to water, bloating time of day, uh, all these things kind of really lend itself in uh, to uh, how to bias your body circumference. But the one thing that does kind of come up is this is very embarrassing to a lot of people, and so they're not going to share it. Um, this is kind of a harder test to administer in that respect. So keep that in mind, uh, especially if you become a practitioner one day and you're having to do this. Keep in mind that it's not a comfortable test to do. Um, and so be very, very compassionate, very, very empathetic. That way you can do this at a professional level and have your customer or client come back. Body fat is finally kind of where I'm wanting to get to. Um, and this is uh, done in several different ways. I've just listed four here. Uh, Daily Burn has a whole bunch of them. Google has a whole bunch of them. Um, these are the ones that are probably the most commonly known. Uh, but basically what we're doing um, is we're identifying the amount of fat that is readily available to assess. We're not looking at your visceral fat, although this gives us a pretty good clue. Um, and so the number one thing is skin fold. I've linked a video on how to do skin fold measurements. It's different for men and women, but this is probably if you're going to do this daily, I'm sorry, if you're going to do this on your own independently, this is the way I would recommend. I would get my own calipers. I wouldn't spend a lot of money. You can spend a crazy amount of money. I'd get kind of what I have pictured here. And I would do this at the same time of day after the same amount of fasting. Uh, and I would identify, you know, this time period. And I would do it maybe once a month because that's about the only amount of time that you're going to get to get a significant change in it. But skin fold measurements are absolutely a great way to go. Hydrostatic weighing is better. It's just not very accessible unless you have an exercise physiology lab that you can get to. Um, again, video down below. Take a look at that. Bioelectrical impedance 
gets kind of a bad rap because they say it's not very valid or accurate. Um, I would tell you if you kind of learn to do this with the same, um, you know, everything else equal, uh, then it does have a value and you can use it. But, you know, if you drink a lot of water before you use it, it's going to change things. If you eat a big heavy meal before you use it, it's going to change things. But it's going to change these as well. Um, and so you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. I would use this one, but I would use it knowing that, yeah, it, it, it may not be consistent if I've changed any variable out there. A DEXA scan is kind of the gold standard now. It used to be hydrostatic weighing, now a DEXA scan is. The problem is DEXA scans are like really expensive x-rays that look at the bone mineral density, but also your fat uh, accumulation. It's a really great test. Um, I highly recommend it. If you have the money and you're willing to burn it, go get it done. It's a great thing to see. Um, however, if you don't have like, you know, a huge pot of cash just laying around that you're wanting to burn up, then I wouldn't do it. I would stick to doing simple things like skin fold and bioelectrical impedance. By the way, the BIA here, bioelectrical impedance, can be purchased through a lot of scales that you buy, bathroom scales that you buy, and it runs it just uh, right up there when you actually do your your weight. So again, validity, maybe not so much, but convenience, man, you can't beat it. Uh, and then finally, the last thing here is our visual and clothing assessment. Um, number one, this is easy. You can look in the mirror and you can inspect at any given time what it's looking like right there and that gives you immediate feedback and plus you probably see yourself a lot so you know when things are changing another thing is though it's private you don't have to disclose this to anyone um, it can be readily reproduced and standardized so you're doing this at the same time on this day of the week after this much fasting or exercise and you're able to see exactly what's going on which is really good because again it's reproducible very easy to do um, it can be very motivational it can also um, be very um, stressful because when you see it you're like oh my gosh what have I done um, I ate this and now I'm bloated but bloating is temporary and it goes away so don't freak out um, we'll kind of address that you know maybe from a dietary standpoint what foods are likely to bloat everyone can do this though and they can do it right now so i hope that you kind of take that into perspective and you look at the assignment and you think about what things you're going to do so take your quiz take your assignment get ready for nutrition 101 this is not a nutrition class but uh and and i'm not a nutrition or a dietitian guy but I am passionate about it, and I'm going to give you the facts on how you can get started on your own nutritional pursuits. Hope you enjoyed. Leave me some feedback. Talk to you soon.